Welcome back to another Taking the Biz A-Level Revision Tutorial and in this video we'll be taking a look at how to compose supply and demand diagrams. Now we've already looked at the concepts of supply and demand in previous videos and we'll link to those above but essentially supply is the amount of a product that the producers in a particular market are prepared to offer at a given price whereas demand is the amount of a product that the consumers are willing to purchase at a particular price and of course if you are looking for additional help in revising for your A-level business examinations you can of course head over to takingthebiz.com where you will find two ebooks that are perfect to support support you in your revision. The Hot Topic Guidebooks 1 is perfect for revising topics you might have come across during the first year of your A-level. And the Hot Topics Guidebook 2 looks at some of those challenging topics that you might encounter during the second year of your A-level. Now, some exam boards require students to be able to draw supply and demand diagrams in their examination. So let's have a look at how that works, starting with something known as the demand curve. Now, the law of demand states that the higher the price for a good, the fewer consumers there will be that will be willing to purchase it. So when the price is quite high, we might find that relatively few consumers are prepared to purchase it. And then at different price points lower down the scale, more and more consumers might be willing to part with their hard-earned cash and purchase that good, which creates what's known as a downward sloping demand curve, which we might draw on diagrams. Now, in examinations, we might be required to draw movements in the demand curve in order to secure marks. And what causes the demand curve to move or shift, we should really say, is a change in circumstances in the market that might affect consumers. For example, Imagine there is a scenario that means that even though the price of that particular good doesn't change, more people might now be willing to purchase it. This would lead to a movement or a shift outwards or to the right of the demand curve. And essentially, all that is illustrating is that at the same price, more consumers would now be willing to purchase that product. But there might be scenarios that mean that at the same price, now fewer consumers are willing to purchase that product. And again, we can represent that diagrammatically with a shift in the demand curve. This time, the shift would be inwards or to the left, which represents that at a particular price, now there are fewer consumers that want to purchase that product. Now, there are various different scenarios that might explain why the demand curve might shift. And again, check out those links to those other videos on demand that will explain in more detail some of those factors. But one of the most basic might be a change in the price of alternative or substitute goods that consumers could purchase. Think about it for a moment. If you're choosing between two rival products and the price of one goes up, then even though the price of the second product remains the same, more customers might now be tempted to purchase it. Another factor that might lead to shifts in the demand curve are changes in people's income. If people are being paid less in society, then it makes sense that fewer of them are either willing or even able to purchase that good at the price that it's at. But if we have the inverse relationship and people's incomes are soaring, then even though the price of the product might remain constant, we might now find that in that market, there are more people prepared to purchase it. So far on our diagrams, we've drawn a demand curve, which illustrates the number of consumers that might be willing to purchase a product at a given price. Now we're ready to draw the supply curve, which moves in the opposite direction, because it illustrates that when prices are low, there are going to be fewer producers that are happy or willing to manufacture that good or that service. And as prices get higher, Either more new entrants are going to want to jump into that market and produce it, or the firms that are already active in that market might be prepared to increase the scale of their output. And as prices get higher in that marketplace, more and more firms are going to want to produce that good, which means that the supply curve slopes upwards. Supply goes up to the sky to illustrate that the higher the price that's set in the market, the more producers are going to want to manufacture of that particular good or provide of that particular service. Now, in examinations, just as we could be asked to illustrate shifts in the demand curve, we could be required to do exactly the same with the supply curve. And just like demand, it can shift to the right or outwards, and it can shift inwards or to the left. 
If it was to shift outwards, that would mean that something has happened in the marketplace that means that suppliers are more willing to produce that product at a particular price. So even though they couldn't necessarily sell it for a higher price point, some other scenario has occurred which now means producers are prepared to manufacture more of it. But we can also have shifts inwards of the supply curve as well, which means even though the price that this product could command has stayed exactly the same, another scenario has changed, which means that now suppliers are less willing to produce it. Now, one of the most common factors that might scare producers off and mean that they are less willing to produce a product at a particular price point is changes in their costs. Now, if you imagine, if the price that the firm is selling at remains constant, but their manufacturing costs are rising, their profit margins per sale are going to be squeezed, which means that it becomes a less attractive proposition for those firms to manufacture their goods. But the opposite is, of course, also true. And if production costs are falling, firms will want to produce more of a particular good, even though the price they can sell it at is remaining the same, because now they can make greater profits per sale. A similar scenario is true when it comes to taxation. When the government increases taxes or duties, that a particular firm might be subject to, then it makes it less attractive to produce that product. But when those taxes are reduced, more entrants might want to flood into the market and produce this good, and the firms that are already active will want to increase the scale of their output. And we could also add subsidies to the list of factors that might affect willingness of firms to supply a particular good or service. When the government is literally paying producers in the form of a subsidy to produce a particular good or service, then of course entrepreneurs are going to want to manufacture more of it. But when those subsidies are reduced, or maybe when they disappear altogether, then the willingness of firms to supply that good might be affected negatively. Now, it would be rare in an exam for you to be required to draw a demand curve or a supply curve in isolation. It's far more common to see them both on the same diagram, and you might be required to label what's known as the equilibrium price on your diagram as well. And that essentially is the point where the supply curves and the demand curves intersect. In markets, using the market mechanism, the price that is set in that market is determined by where the supply or the willingness to supply intersects with the willingness to purchase at a particular price. Now, just replicating that very basic structure of a supply and demand diagram with an equilibrium price labelled upon it will be enough to score you some marks for most examination boards. But to get full marks on questions about supply and demand diagrams, you may be presented with a scenario where you have to make a shift in the diagram. So add a new line to it. For example, imagine we were given a scenario in a question that said that consumers' incomes in societies are increasing, reflect how this might affect the supply and demand diagram for a particular product or market. Well, when we're making shifts in supply and demand, the first thing that we've got to try and register is whether the scenario that we're presented with is something that's going to have an impact on consumers and their willingness to purchase? Or is it a factor that's going to have an impact on firms and their willingness to supply? In this scenario, we've got consumer incomes rising. Now, it makes sense to me that if it's consumers that are experiencing rising incomes in their wages and their salaries, that's going to affect demand and how much they wish to purchase rather than firms and how much they wish to supply. And if consumer incomes are rising, theoretically, that will mean that more people at each price point are prepared to purchase a particular good or service, which would mean that our demand curve would shift to the right. To get full marks in the examination, we would then mark up where the new equilibrium price would be and just label it on our diagram as P1 and Q1, and we've successfully shifted the demand curve. But we've got to be on our toes in examinations because we might get thrown an entirely different scenario. This time, imagine that we have a substitute good that consumers could purchase instead of ours, and the price of that good has fallen. Well, if rivals have now started selling their goods at a lower price than we are charging, then it makes sense to me that consumers are going to start making some decisions 
And if they can see that there is a comparative good available at a lower price, then even though the price of our good is going to remain constant, we might see that fewer consumers are now prepared to shop with us and buy our product, which leads to a shift in the demand curve, but this time to the left. If we successfully draw that in the examination and throw on the new equilibrium, label it up as P1 and Q1, then again, we're going to be impressing the examiner. But not all of the scenarios that the examiner gives us might affect consumers. We might think that some of them are going to have a far bigger impact on the producers and the firms than they would do on the end customer, for example. Imagine we're given the scenario by the examiner where they tell us that production costs in a particular industry have now risen. Think about this as a supplier. If your production costs are rising, are you going to want to produce more of this product? Or are you going to want to scale back your production and potentially produce something less instead? Well, I think it would probably be the latter, which would mean that supply would shift inwards to the left. And just like we did when we were shifting the demand curve, if we draw on the new equilibrium and label it up as P1 and Q1, we've satisfied the examiner that we know how to illustrate shifts in the supply curve. And of course, we can also shift supply the other way if the scenario dictates. I imagine the examiner tells us about a scenario where the government introduces a new or a larger subsidy for a good. Now, firms are going to be rubbing their hands together thinking, I would like to produce as much of this product as possible. That will lead supply to shift rather than demand. Supply will shift outwards to the right to illustrate that now producers want to manufacture more of that particular good. And as always, we label up the new equilibrium P1Q1, maybe even throw a little arrow on the diagram each time to illustrate that shift. And now we've successfully drawn our supply and demand diagrams with shifts to impress the examiner.